important discussion in our community. Vice President Joe Biden, Dr. Jill Biden is in the house, I believe, somewhere. As she always does. I'd like to welcome both of you here for what you know is a town of love, unity, and compassion. As you know, you spent most of your career unifying people, bringing people together. And much like in your hometown, Scranton, you've often talked about family values, working class families. Kenosha is that kind of town where we come together as people and what unites us in our inner soul is love, compassion, and in this time of healing and hurt and pain, we need that love and compassion. And we know your leadership is all about unity, not division. It's about healing. So we thank you for being here today because we know your leadership is important in Kenosha and in our country. But we also know, and let's be clear, Black Americans face systemic racism in a variety of areas. Let's be real about that. Much like many marginalized communities, far too long. And we know with your vision and your leadership and your sense of urgency to dismantle systemic racism in healthcare, workforce development, education, affordable housing. We know your vision will heal this country. We know your vision will bring neighborhoods back together. And we thank you for that. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our host, Reverend Barker. Please come and give us opening prayer. Well, welcome everybody. It is a real privilege to look out on my neighbors here in Kenosha, and I can see so many people who have had at the core of their life seeking welfare and praying for the welfare of our city. So it is a real privilege to have all of you here today. It is a real privilege to have Vice President Joe Biden here today to listen and to seek healing and justice for us in Kenosha. And so thank you all for taking time this afternoon to come to Grace Lutheran. Welcome. Well, please rise as you're able as I offer a prayer. Let us pray. Oh, healing God, we continue to lift up Jacob Blake. Lord, continue to bring healing to his grievous wounds. Lord, miraculously enable him to walk again. Lord, we lift up his family. Bring them comfort during this tumultuous, challenging time. O oh God of justice, we ask for justice for Jacob Blake. We ask for justice for our community here in Kenosha. O oh God who anoints leaders to guide us, we ask that you anoint the leader of our country in November who will at their core Seek justice, love mercy, humbly walk with you, and love their neighbor as themselves. And God, I have great confidence that you will make that happen for us in November. I pray all of these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Reverend Barker for those inspiring words. And also I wanna thank you for the great work you do in the neighborhood. As you know, not far from here, we have devastation and destruction and we know your church has had a leadership role in that rebuild and recovery. So thank you for that and many blessings. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen, we're here to have a community conversation, is that right? There's a few ground rules in the interest of safety and health and wellness that we protect each other. So social distancing rules are important and will be applied. We have four selected speakers that we're gonna start with. I'll call them up. We'll ask them to speak and speak to the mic that's closest to you. And then after they're finished, 
We'll call up folks as you choose to speak. However, we ask that you practice the social distancing and the microphones that are here. Take your time. We'll give you about five minutes per person. I've been told I have the right to kind of put the mask over your mouth and shut it down a little bit. Shut it down a little bit. But take your time. Because as you know, Vice President Joe Biden is here to listen and learn and help us heal. Fair enough? First with us is Tim Tompkins, community resident, former Marine. Tim? Uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for coming today. Um, what I'd like to talk about what's occurring in Wisconsin is really something that was an American issue, and that's about race and equality. And when we talk about race and equality in America, we need to move beyond the conversation of programs. We need to start putting money behind the programs and putting things into action. Um, several years ago, Ben Carson, I'm sorry, I'm a, Ben Gordon, who was with the NAACP said, we know what the problems are. We need to start putting money behind the solutions. We know what the problems are in the African American community. We know what the problems are in the Hispanic community. But when you're looking at Wisconsin, which is one of the, which is considered the worst place in the United States for people of color, 34% of African Americans live in poverty, 24% of Hispanics, 28% of Native American Indians, and 18% of people of, who are of Asian descent. So when you talk about that race inequality, it also means about inclusion and taking those steps that we need to address those issues. We need to address the issues of employment. Um, we have all of these jobs that are around here, but we don't have median, um, the median income and the difference between white families and African Americans in the state of Wisconsin is 50%. We're earning 50% of what those family incomes are. And so if we're not paying people living wages, the automotive industry that was here, McWhite, um, uh, American Brass, uh, we're, we're uh, a community that built things. And so we've got a lot of intelligent people. We have a lot of skills that are still here. It's just tapping into those resources and creating those opportunities in employment. Um, when I was the HR director in a municipality, one of the things that we did is we banned the box. We don't need to look for new employees, so, um, look for a workforce. Um, we're, we're, we're pushing them out of the prison system each and every day. When those individuals come back to our communities, what we need to do is start providing second chances for them. We also need to address the gaps within our education system. Not that we don't have a public education system, but we have a public education system that is not equitable. We need to make sure that each program in every school is the same. We need to make sure that black sports programs and white sports programs are funded the same. We need to make sure that science programs and art programs are funded the same. Not that they just exist, but that, that they have the same quality and that they're still of the same quilt because you cannot build programs that do not have the same resources and economic ability to push those forwards to be successful. Uh, the biggest thing that I see going on right now, and it just breaks my heart, when we talk about race and equality, we have to look at housing. Right now, we look at what's going on during this COVID. We have so many people right now, because of not having the economics and not being in work at this time, they're losing their housing. If you looked over Texas over the last couple of days, it's heartbreaking to see all these people in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of just having a hurricane come through this area, and now they're being placed on the streets with their belongings. And so we've got to move beyond that. The other thing that's still out there is that we need to create jobs. We need to create living wages and opportunities for people so that they can be a part of that American dream. I was going to talk about the criminal justice system, but we have such a wonderful person here who's going to be able to follow up on that. And we have to realize that we, we've got to stop pushing people into jail. We have to start getting solutions such as rehabilitation. When the crack epidemic hit America, and it was in the black community, America's solution was jail, jail, jail. Now that we have opioids in the white community, the solution is to provide police firefighters with Narcon and save their lives and send them back home to their families and make sure that they have the rehabilitation services. We really need to take a look at our criminal justice system because we don't have the mental health services and we don't have the drug addiction 
and other services needed to prevent people from being caught up in a cycle that takes away from that American dream and takes away from that opportunity for equity. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Jeff Widener, if you please come forward. 30 years of great service as a firefighter. Wonderful young man. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for coming. Um, thanks for listening. Um, our members are tired uh, after this past week. Uh, some of them are beat up pretty good. But their spirits are high. And the reason that their spirits are high is because of the appreciation and love that our community has shown us after the fires. Um, everything that's been dropped off at the firehouses to people uh, stopping us on the street and telling us thanks. And it made me think about appreciation. I think a lot of people at a lot of different levels need to start showing appreciation for one another and letting people know that everybody matters. Um, I know I feel good when I feel appreciated. I think it's a basic human thing that everybody else does too. One of the interesting things in the fire department is that we have an opportunity to see so many social and economic problems in people's homes before there is a program, before there is access to health care, before there is an actual problem. I've seen it for 30 years. Um, I'd like to tell you that it's getting better every day, but it's not. One of the things that we see, particularly in the areas of people of color, is their ability to access health care at a time when it is, when it has a chance to, to be preventative, to be healing. So many of the things that we see are a result of chronic um, ability not to get at health care. Those, those small things turn into chronic things. Those chronic things turn into emergencies. That's when we get called. Um, and as a result of that, our systems are being, are being taxed. And in many cases, and we've even asked people, why, why did you not s seek help from your doctor? I don't have a doctor. Why, why did you not take this heart medication? I can't afford it. Okay, well now we're at a point now where you're taking a trip to the emergency room. It, at times we are the only health care that some folks have access to. We never fail to show up. We show up damn fast. And sometimes even that's not enough. So those are some of the things that we see with regard to a problem in the community that needs attention. If there, were, if there were clinics or there were availability for low-level health care access, um, we wouldn't see quite so much of what we have to deal with from an emergent standpoint. Um, and again, <laughs> pride, dedication, and courage. That's what we all signed up for. Uh, our thumbs are all up. and. We're forging forward, and we'd like a whole bunch of other people to be able to feel the same kind of appreciation we do. So thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Jeff, thank you for that, and thank you for continuing to keep Kenosha safe, and, and uh, we appreciate that. 103 years of service. Barb DeBerg, would you come forward, please? Can I touch this? Thank you, Joe, for being here. It's, it's a great honor for, for me to be invited here. Um, I, my name is Barb DeBerg, and my sister and I have a framing and art gallery two blocks down the road. Our great-grandfather started our business, and our business has succeeded through recessions, depressions, and all the difficulties that, that happen and, but we have never, ever seen anything as devastating as what has gone on in our community. Um, we're very fortunate because they didn't start our building on fire. 
like so many of them in the uptown area have been burnt to the ground. They did uh, break our windows, get into our store, um, they looted, and they tried to start a fire, but a good Samaritan came by and took this rack of our beautiful scarves out into the sidewalk and put it out. Otherwise, our store would have been up in flames. And um, I look at the buildings in our community that are gone, and I just, I don't think, I don't think I've really grieved as much as I feel I should because I just, being a business owner, I have to keep going and I have to keep working. The day after this happened at our store, it was on Sunday they went downtown and did their de devastation. And then on Monday night they came in our area. So um, Tuesday morning we had a group of uh, fellows come and board up our building and we were open for business. And we've been continuing to be open for business even though it's boarded up. And the love and compassion in this community has been overwhelming, not only to us, but the whole community. People are coming out, coming together, and showing respect and love towards each other. And it makes me so very proud to be in this community. That's what we do when we have difficulties. We support and help and love. So thank you so much for allowing me to come here and give you a, um, a business perspective. We're lucky we're still standing. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. You know the community loves your store very much, and anything we can do to continue to help rebuild you, we will. Thank you very much. Sir, you're about to hear from one of the sharpest, youngest legal minds in Kenosha. Angela Cunningham, please come up. Why, thank you, Tim. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Vice President, and thank you for joining us here today. Um, you know the reason Kenosha is in the spotlight right now is because of the sh shooting of Jacob Blake. I will never forget that Sunday afternoon. I was watching a live video of someone who was on the scene and trying to figure out what was going on. Um, and I was reading the comments and I saw people commenting about the fact that Jacob Blake had been shot by officers. Then I saw the video of the actual incident. I don't even think I have the words to describe how I felt when I saw that video. I do remember texting my group of friends and saying, this is really bad. This is really bad. There's gonna be protests, there's gonna be rioting. I knew that right away after watching that video. My mom called me. I have a 20 year old black man for a son. My mom called me shortly after the news got out about what happened because she knows we live in Kenosha and her first thought was, is Sean okay? Is he all right? I knew he was okay because I knew he was at work. Mr. President, as an, or Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking into the Mr. President part. <laughs> Mr. Vice President, as an attorney, I know legally why a lot of officers who kill um, black men and women are not held legally responsible, criminally legally responsible for their actions because the law protects them. I recognize that and I know that. I don't agree with it, but I recognize that and I know that. And I hope that if and when you are elected president, that that is something that your administration chooses to try to address because I feel that the law protects a lot of police officers. And I know a lot of those laws are at the state level, but if at the federal level something can be done to incentivize states to not give so much legal protection to police officers who kill black men and women. I also wanna talk as an attorney, I have my own law firm here, ADC Law Office. Part of my practice is doing criminal defense work. I'm also a former prosecutor out of Milwaukee. So I have been on both sides of the aisle. And what I've seen in the criminal courts is unfair treatment between white defendants 
versus black and brown defendants. There is over-policing in our communities. So you have black and brown people who are picked up for a lot of times what could be minor things. Then they got a criminal record. Then that criminal record means that they have a stamp on their back that makes it difficult for them to get jobs and more likely to get stay involved in the criminal justice system so then you get a resume that gets built. I would love to see legislation put in place to try to address some of the over-policing in communities. I would also like to see some transparency in policing and prosecution and sentencing. Because I sit in courts, well, I used to before COVID, but sit in courts all day and I listen to cases and can see what's going on, I'm able to see the differential treatment in charging and, off and offers that are given by the, the prosecution and in sentencing that's given by judges. Anybody who's not in court every day won't see that. And that data is not readily available. So I would love to see a nationwide effort put in place that requires police departments, um, district attorney's offices, and also courts to collect the data about arrests, about charges, about sentencing, about offers that are given, so that the light can be shown for people who don't sit in court all day to see that we're not just talking, that there really is a discrepancy. And I think that's the first step that needs to be taken in order to make a difference. And then once we know what the actual numbers are, start putting some legislation in place to try to address some of those discrepancies. Thank you for your listening today. Thank you to our, our four speakers. Uh, Mr. Vice President, would you like to take a few moments to respond and chat with the community? First of all, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. And I hope, I don't know how much time you have after I say a few words. Maybe I can hear from more of you as well, but let me respond to uh, a little bit of what I've heard so far. First of all, um, if I can make a generic point, the words of a president matter. No matter whether they're good, bad, or indifferent, they matter. No matter how competent or incompetent the president is, they can send a nation to war, they can bring peace, they can make markets rise or fall. And they can do things that, I, uh, that I've observed uh, can make a difference just by what they say. You know, uh, I, was, uh, I got out of law school and I uh, moved back to Delaware. I had a partial scholarship to go away. We didn't have a law school at the time in Delaware. I went to Syracuse Law School. When I came home from law school, uh, what happened was my last semester, the only two political heroes I ever had, both were assassinated, Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy. As a matter of fact, Kennedy was assassinated the day I graduated. And I came home, and my city is the only city in the United States of America occupied by the military since Reconstruction for 10 months. Every single corner with someone, a military person, standing with a drawn bayonet, not a joke, 10 months. And I had a job with a good law firm, a well-known law firm, one of the oldest law firms in the state. And after, uh, after a while, I concluded that uh, I was in the wrong place. They were good people, but I quit and became a public defender. And um, I used to uh, have uh, interview my clients in what they call the Northeast Corridor, where Amtrak runs from you know Washington to New York. That that area it goes right through my city. And uh, and I used to interview clients down in the basement of that train station before they were arraigned. And, um, and here I was uh, thinking that, and we have the eighth largest black population of any state in the nation as a percent of the population. And we were, to our great shame, a slave state. And uh, although we were one of those border states who fought on the side of the North, thank God. But uh, anyway, make a long story short, um, what happened was uh, I thought black and whites would never be in my city to talk to each other again. And here I was then, literally 40 years later to the month, on January 17th, standing on a platform at that very same station. 
I'm looking out over what we call the east side, which had been burned to the ground, literally. It had been completely leveled, you know, when things get burned out, they come in and level everything. And then across the Christina River, they called the Third Street Bridge. It was all overwhelmingly 100% African American community. And I was standing on that platform on January 17th, waiting for a uh, black man to come 26 miles from Philadelphia to pick me up and take me on the train ride to Washington, D.C. with 10,000 people standing down below cheering. And my son, Bo, was alive then. He was the attorney general of the state of Delaware at the time. And uh, my daughter, who's a social worker, ran the largest criminal justice program in the state. And my son, my middle son, who was the running the World Food Health Program, the World Food Program USA, the largest program in the, country, in the world. And, um, uh, and I called them up, and all of a sudden hit me. Here I was, and that whole area had been rebuilt. And the Third Street Bridge is still in a little bit of trouble, but things have moved. And I said, don't tell me things can't change. And I told them about the story. My of violating social distancing here, walking up. I guess I am. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And um, and I said, don't tell me things can't change. And I told the story and pointed, reminded them what it was when I was a young attorney. And uh, But I made a mistake about something. I thought you could defeat hate. Hate only hides. It only hides. And when someone in authority breathes oxygen under that rock, it legitimizes those folks to come on out, come out front of the rocks. And, um, and uh, I hadn't planned on running for anything again after my son had died. And I was a professor at a college and running a, another program at another college. Until I saw those people coming out of Charlottesville carrying torches, literally torches coming out of the fields. Close your eyes, remember what you saw on television. Their veins bulging, their hate-filled speech, chanting the same anti-Semitic bile that was chanted in the streets of Germany in the 30s. And on top of that, um, accompanied by white supremacists, Ku Klux Klan, a young woman was killed protesting the, those folks. And the President of the United States was asked, he was asked, what do you think? And he said, quote, something no president's ever, ever said. He said, there are very fine people on both sides. No president has ever said anything like that. The generic point I'm making is, it's not all his fault, but it legitimizes. It legitimizes the dark side of human nature. And what it did, though, it also exposed what had not been paid enough attention to, and the underlying racism that is institutionalized in the United States still still exists, has existed for 400 years. And, uh, and so what's happened is that it, we end up in a circumstance like you had here in Kenosha and have here in Kenosha. But, you know, I am as my I had a serious operation years ago, a neurosurgeon, and I was, he gave me a relatively small chance to make it after it was all over. I said, I'll be fine. And he said, you know what your problem is, Senator? He said, you're a congenital optimist. Well, I think we've reached an inflection point in American history. I honest to God believe we have an enormous opportunity now that the, the screen, the, the, the curtain's been pulled back on just what's going on in the country to do a lot of really positive things. You know, as much as they say that, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter has lost some standing since the president's gone on this rant about, you know, law and order, et cetera, still you have over 50% of the American people supporting. It was up to 78. That's never happened before. People are beginning to see because of COVID who the people are out and breaking their necks and risking their lives keep them safe in their homes. You know that old definition of a firefighter. God made man, and then he made a couple firefighters. You're all crazy, thanks God. 
I grew up in a neighborhood you either became a firefighter or a priest, and I wasn't qualified for either, so here I am. But all kidding aside, think of what's happened. Think of all the people. Who are all those people? You got over 6,000 young dreamers, quote unquote, dreamers, you know, in the Hispanic community, who in fact uh, are on the front lines dealing with COVID. You have all those folks working in a supermarket, stacking the shelves, making five, six, seven bucks an hour. In fact, uh, and they're mostly minorities, African-Americans, Latinos. People are beginning to figure out who we are as a country. This is not who we are. This is not who we are. So the first point I want to make to you all is I am not pessimistic. I'm optimistic about the opportunity if we seize it. Now let me respond to each one, each, what each of you had to say. Tim, you talked about this a lot more than uh, you got to put money behind the solutions. The country's ready to put that money behind the solutions now. Here's what I propose, and it's going to happen. You point out 30% poverty rate among African Americans. You have living wages that don't exist. We're going to nationalize $15 an hour. No one should ever work, have to work two jobs just to make it. That's not right in America. Just two jobs just to make, just to make the, just to be above the poverty rate, above the poverty level. Prison reform, there's a whole lot of forms it takes, but my view is we should turn prison reform, and I've been preaching this for the last five years, from prison punishment to reform. So, for example, anybody serves their time in prison and they get out, they should be entitled to every single program that exists under the federal government. Why don't we want them getting a Pell Grant and going to school? Why don't we want them getting a job and being able to get public housing, housing subsidies? Why don't we want them qualifying for what used to be called food stamps? But right now, I wrote years ago with a guy named Specter, a senator from Pennsylvania, the Second Chance Act. Because right now, we're in a situation where you get out of prison, I don't think you all know this, you get a, you get a bus ticket and 25 bucks. By the way, 93% of everybody, 93 out of every 100 prisoners in prison are behind a city jail, a county jail, a state jail, not a federal prison. Brock and I were able to re reduce the prison population federally by 38,000 folks. Anybody who gets convicted of a drug crime, not one that is in terms of massive selling, but consumption, they shouldn't go to prison. They should go to mandatory rehabilitation. Instead of building more prisons, I've been proposing for some time, we build rehabilitation centers, mandatory. They've got to go to mandatory rehab. But it's not part of the record when they get out if they finish it. Because the point you made, you get a record and it stays with you. Sorry, you can't get the job because you had did the following, even if it's a misdemeanor. We shouldn't be putting anybody in jail for that. We should find ourselves in a situation where housing, Right now in the United States of America, we don't have the kind of housing funding we had back in our administration earlier before that, even in Republican administrations. No one should have to pay more than 30% of their income to be able to live and have housing, including people on the street. That's why I proposed the $400 billion program to vastly increase available housing in America. And by the way, it's not a waste of money. Even the folks on Wall Street point out that will increase the GDP. Make it grow. People will do better. People will do better. Hard as a devil for any of your clients who are black to get a, an entrepreneurial b business loan. All the studies show they're just as qualified to be able to succeed as anyone else is. Brock and I put together a program that was $1.5 billion that brought $30 billion off the sidelines. And we, we provide that program for the local small business association so you can go and apply. Because guess what? If you get a loan, then the private sector says, hey, he's got government backing him. We're going to join him. We'll get in to deal with him or her. We're going to move that to $150 billion. It's fundamentally changing where we go. Okay, I, I'm giving you too much. I can see you're about to stand up. <laughs> Mental health. Mental health is a badly needed commodity right now. That's why in the Affordable Care Act, we insisted it be treated equally. There's no difference between a mental health problem and a physical health problem. They're both related to your health. They sh should be both covered. You talked about the whole idea of federal support, you know, 
clinics. And, you know, we, we, we need community clinics. You guys are expected to do everything right now. And Barb, you talked about, you know, re rebuilding. Well, you know what? Let's get something straight here. Protesting is protesting, my buddy John Lewis used to say. But none of it justifies looting, burning, or anything else. So regardless how angry you are, if you loot or you burn, you should be held accountable as someone who does anything else, period. It, it's just not, it just cannot be tolerated across the board. And Angela, you know, you, uh, you talk about the whole issue of uh, sentencing. One of the things that I've proposed is we make sure that prosecutors are able to ha have to list what the option charges were given to persons. For example, if you're a white guy who can afford a lawyer and you're charged with a crime, you're not charged with nine crimes nine and given nine alternatives and say, if you plead the, la the, the, the least one, we're going to put you on probation. And, but, uh, and you have no lawyer. Or you have a public defender who's getting paid half the federal prosecutor's getting paid. Public defenders are going to get paid the same of federal public defenders, the same amount as prosecutors are going to get paid. So you have representation. Because once you get that on your record, you've got a real problem. Well, two people show up for a job, you have that thing you pled to, you weren't guilty of any of it. But rather than run the risk of going to jail for five years, you pled to get out from under anything, meaning just probation. That happens all the time. That's why we have to have the Federal Department of Justice, which is not much of a Department of Justice right now, have the ability to go and look at the methods that are used by prosecutors in their offices, how they, in fact, deal with sentencing and what they do. There's a lot more to say, but I probably already said too much, except that <laughs> there's a lot we're able to do. The public is ready to do these things. I promise you. I promise you, last piece, education. The idea in the United States of America, your education is determined by your zip code. Title I schools, you all know what a Title I school is, mostly in black and Hispanic neighborhoods, but also poor white neighborhoods where they can't afford the tax base. They don't have the Title I schools are able to get $15 billion a year to make up for the $200 billion gap that exists between them and and, 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 and other school districts, white school districts. Well, guess what? We move that to 45 billion a year. It means I can put every three, four, and five-year-old in school, in school. We've learned a lot in the last eight years. Every major university and prestigious university in the country has pointed out that it increases by 58% the chances that that child, no matter what home they came from, will get all the way through all 12 years of school. It also insists that we provide for, right now we have one, one school psychologist for every 1,505 kids in America. We know now that about 60% of a child's brain is developed by the time they reach that age. And anxiety that exists with children that can be identified early is able to be dealt with, anxiety. But they don't do it now because they, don't, they can't pick it up. And their situation, again, where when you do that, we know, we know that the most at-risk generation for the first time in American history is the Z generation. They have the greatest degree of anxiety of any generation all the way up the scale, no matter where they are. We've also learned, and I'll end with this. I know you're getting too antsy. Sit down, man. No, I get it. Okay. <laughs> here. How do but, I but do here, that, here's right? the last How do I thing. stop but, that? But, 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 but this is important. Here's the deal. If you think about it, we've finally figured out Drug abuse doesn't call mental, cause mental health problems. Mental health problems cause drug abuse. And if you don't detect the anxiety in children early and deal with it and treat it, you increase exponentially the prospect that they're going to be, in fact, find themselves susceptible to the, what's happening in the community. The generic point I'm making is there's so much we can do. So much we can do. And we can do it just by eliminating the tax cut for the top one-tenth of one percent, which is one trillion three hundred and fifty billion dollars has done nothing to help anybody. Nineteen corporations making a billion dollars apiece don't pay a single penny in taxes. I'm not going to punish anybody, but everybody should pay a fair share. 
and I can lay out for you. I won't now because they'll shoot me. But here's the deal. I pay for every single thing I'm proposing without raising your taxes one penny. If you make less than 400 grand, you're not going to get a penny tax, and you're going to get a tax cut if you make under $125,000. So it's not we can't do this. We haven't been willing to do this. But I think the public's ready. I'll do whatever you tell me, boss. <laughs> you are the boss. I know when my dad would tell me to sit down, I sat down. So I'm good. I'm good. I think what you heard here was uh, strength experience and empathy and what we do know is that uh, Vice President Biden you and Kamala Harris have the leadership and strength to restore faith and healing in this country we're going to appreciate you very much we're going to continue the community conversations because uh, I'm sure you have more to, to hear from our community uh, like Portia it. would you like to come forward and, and lead us in the next round of conversation please I don't think everyone's bragging about you. Hello, my name is Portia Bennett. Um, I'm just going to be honest, Mr. Biden. I was told to go off this paper, but I can't. You need the truth. And I'm part of the truth. I was born here, raised here. First eighth grade class of the school that was named after his mother. So I have to give you the truth of the people. And the truth of the matter is, we are heavily angry. Not angry as to where people say, oh, they're protesting. There are different, there's a difference between a protester and a rioter. A very big difference. We protest to get our, our voices heard. We protest to show that not just blacks are tired of what's going on. As you can see, there are blacks, whites, Muslims, Chinese, Hispanic that are out there. We came together to help get this community together as well because we live here and we want it to stay the way we've always had it. But the changes that we want has to be more in effect. We hear so many people saying, oh, we're going to give you this, we're going to give you that. But we have yet to see action. And I was always raised to go off action and not words because you'll be, feel, you'll, you'll be let down every single time. And the action we want are hold these officers accountable to the same crimes that we guilty had accountable to. If I was that officer, I would be under Kenosha County Jail right now. If I was these officers who commit these crimes because if a medical examiner just, and, and if a medical examiner does their job and says, oh, I'm ruling it homicide, that's murder. Why are they not being done the same exact way that me or my brothers and sisters out here in this world are being treated? Why are there more police officers in the black neighborhoods than in other neighborhoods? Why are, why are we more targeted than anybody else? We walk somewhere, automatically it's, you fit the description. We wear something, automatically it's, oh, you're a bad person. I'm only 31, and I've seen enough within these last two years to say I'm tired. I'm a mother. My oldest is 13. My twins are nine. I do this because I want their future to be better than what I have right now, because my present is not good. But I speak because I want the truth heard, and I speak for the people in this city because I live in this city and I'm out here with these people. A lot of people won't tell the truth, but I'm telling the truth. It's not what a lot of people think it is for us. We want the same exact rights as others. We want to be treated just like everyone else. A lot of us get denied jobs because we mark that box as black or African American, knowing we are overly qualified for that position. People come in and tear down our houses in our neighborhoods instead of put, fixing them up and making them better. And now we're all pushed to one side of town. Gentrification has to stop as well. We can't get that if someone with that voice can't put that into effect. That's all we're asking. We want the same treatment. 
We're not asking, oh, put us above anybody. We're not saying we matter more than anybody. None of that. But for so many decades, we've been shown we don't matter. And right now, we just want someone who's actually going to show and put that action in. It's a lot of stuff we want done. And being someone who is out here, who li I literally live directly behind this church. I know the pastor. I come over and help with the food pantry some days. So I know it. I see it. I live it. Others who don't see it and live it can't tell you the truth. They can't really give you the in-depth things that we're going through out here as black and brown people. So I'm telling you, it's way more that we want done. And it didn't just start with Jacob. But we want change. We want change. So I thank you for coming to hear me. I would, <clears throat> excuse me. Someone else would like to come up and provide uh, insights on Kenosha, Alderman Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Vice President, for being here, listening. The spotlight's been on our town. We talked about Sunday, what happened Sunday. And I feel like that was years ago. And when I'm walking out there and talking to my constituents, and I'm talking to my neighbors, and I'm talking to my friends and my family, I hear their pain. The 10th District, the city of Kenosha, did not suffer the same destruction that other parts of the city experienced. But like I spoke to Senator Baldwin, there's a hurt in, our, in my section of town. There is a pain in my section of town. Mr. Mr. Blake was shot two, ho two blocks from my house. But we speak about how we feel then, the despair and the anger and, and all of those things. But I also want to tell you about the humanity that is coming out of these things. We know that someone came here to take a victory lap. We know that someone came here to show division. We know that someone came here not to help us, but the people surrounding the family decided, we're not going to show that picture to the world. We're going to show them something different. And you saw a block party happen right there where, the, where Mr. Blake was shot. You saw people celebrating life. You saw kids playing in bounce houses. You saw services being provided to the community. And this was put together in about a 24-hour period. And I'd love to sit up here and tell you I took credit for it. And I don't, I didn't. It just happened organically with the people that are around them. The spirit, that's the spirit in Kenosha. And that's the thing that gives me hope. What gives me hope about your presidency is that we can stop talking the cynicism. We'll have, when we go out there in that marketplace of, the, of, the, of voting, we'll have a real idea. We'll, we'll, sh we'll give people, <laughs> I don't want to use the other guy's phrase there, but we'll give them hope. <laughs> and that's so important. The things I'm going to need in, in my district in particular it's going to be more of those soft skills. I need, there's going to be, there's some definitely the jobs and economic development and all the things that the other speakers have spoke on. That'll help in my district immensely. But to restore faith in, to, in the system, that's going to be very hard, very difficult. To restore faith in the process, that's going to be very difficult. But when we know the man at the top, yourself, is speaking truth and speaking an honest truth, you're going to make our work here in Kenosha a lot better, and I'm looking forward to that day. And I just, again, want to thank you. 
Sir, would you like to provide any uh, closing remarks? You're good. So I'm going to just stay seated, make it informal. Uh, Portia, you know, the things that I talked about here we have to do didn't start with, uh, even back to Eric Garner, I can't breathe. I've been proposing these for a long time. I mean, literally, for years. And the one thing I think we have to acknowledge, my mom used to have an expression. My mom would say, you want to know me? Come walk in my shoes a mile. Well, um, even though I've been involved in the, with the African-American community and the civil rights movement since I've been a junior in high school, the segregated movie theaters and the like, I can't understand what it's like to walk out the door or send my son out the door or my daughter and worry about just because they're black, they may not come back. I can't really, I, I, I can intellectually understand it, but I can't, I can't feel it. I just spent an hour or more with the, with the, the family as I got off the airplane had an opportunity to spend some time with Jacob on the phone. He's out of ICU. We spoke for about uh, 15 minutes. His brother and two sisters, his dad and his mom on the telephone. And I've spoken to them a lot before, but we spent some time together, my wife. And uh, he talked about how nothing was going to defeat him how whether he walked again or not, he was not going to give up. We talked about a psalm in my ch our church, Father, based on the 23rd psalm. Uh, May he raise you up on eagle's wings and bear you on the breath of dawn until we and ho keep you in, going, hold you in the palm of his hand until we meet again. Well, um, I think, Alderman, what's been unleashed in a lot of people is they understand that um, fear doesn't solve problems. Only hope does. And if you, keep, if you give up hope, you might as well surrender. There's no real option. And as we talked, um, I listened to his mom. She was on the phone. She was in a different, she wasn't with Jacob. She was in the same location. And his, as I said, his dad, his uh, son, his brother, two sisters, and a family lawyer, two family lawyers were there. And um, what I came away with was the overwhelming sense of resilience and optimism that, uh, that they have about the kind of response they're getting. Her, his mom talked about, we asked, my wife asked, to say a prayer, and and his mom said a prayer. And she said, I'm praying for Jacob, but I'm praying for the policeman as well. I'm praying that things change. Um, if you think a little bit about where we are right now, it's been a terrible, terrible, wake-up call that's gotten the rest of the nation to realize that uh, it's a confluence of three things. One, the COVID crisis. Two, the un and we didn't have to have over 6 million people contract COVID, over 186,000 dead in the climbing. If we had acted, if we had we'd just acted, the point has been pointed out by the University of Columbia Law School that if he had acted just one week earlier, 37,000 more people would have been alive. If he acted two weeks earlier, 51,000, maybe 31 and 57 or 51. And, but the point is, over 80,000 people would still be alive. You have to take responsibility 
if you're a leader, a president. Instead of saying, I'm not responsible, it didn't happen on my watch, I take no responsibility. Well, I think the country is much more primed to take responsibility because they now have seen what you see, but you don't experience it the same way you do, Portia, because they're not a bright, young, black woman with two kids here, is it two or three children that you, three children that you have to worry about. But there are changes that are taking place in the country, and one of the problems is that, and it, look, this is not about me. It's really not about me. But if we have four more years, we're going to have four more years of the exact same thing, only it's going to impact us for a couple generations. And the public kind of understands that now. And I think they're so ready to do so many things they either are un fully unaware of or aware of but never registered with them before. Or they just have seen things that they hadn't seen before. You know, when uh, Dr. King, when he said, I know that's ancient history, you weren't even born. But when Bull Connor, I was in grade school, when Bull Connor took those fire hoses and dogs on those black women going to church in their Sunday best and little kids having their skin ripped off them by these high-powered fire hoses, he thought he was putting a wooden stake in the heart of the civil rights movement. But in other parts of the country where they heard about this but didn't believe it ever happened, everybody turned on a black and white TV and they saw it and said, oh my God. Dr. King said it was a second emancipation. It got the Voting Rights Act and it got the Civil Rights Act. Didn't get us all the way there, but made progress. And that young man stood there for eight minutes and I think it was 43 seconds watching, watching Floyd die, having his face pressed up against that curb People not only in the United States, but all around the world said, oh my God, it really, really happens. When you had a man of his size and physicality calling for his mom, it struck a nerve that hadn't been struck before. It's awful, it has to happen. But I think we're at one of those moments. We have this opportunity, if we don't let up, we don't let up. There's a reason why this administration doesn't want to talk about, wants to only talk about dividing the country and about, about law and order. They don't want to talk about all those people have died from COVID. They don't want to talk about the fact that almost a million people again file for unemployment, don't have jobs. They don't want to talk about the fact that you have tens of thousands of businesses closing, and maybe for good. And I want to talk about the fact that <coughs> the Congress passed legislation, the HEROES Act, to provide money for states to be able to keep firefighters on the job, teachers on the job, first responders on the job, et cetera. They want to talk about that because they don't want to do it. They don't feel it's their obligation, so they're trying to divert us the attention they have. If I get elected president, I promise you, there will be a national commission on policing out of the White House where I'll bring everyone to the table, including police chiefs, including civil rights activists, including the NAACP, including the, the African, the, the Latino community. We're going to sit down there and we're going to work it out because a significant portion of the police are decent people. But no one, there's a lot of bad folks in every organization. There's not a whole lot of people who want to speak up, be the odd man out or odd woman out, no matter what outfit you work with. And so we got to give a chance to change things, and we can. There is not a single solitary reason in the world why, why, as I said, we shouldn't be in a position 
that everybody, and that's my wife, Jill. Hey, Jill, I'm Jill's husband, actually. But I, I guess I, I should cut to the chase here. We're, we're in a situation now where we cannot let up. We cannot let up. Violence in any form is wrong. The idea that this president continues to try to divide us, give succor to the white supremacist, talks about how there's really good people on both sides, talks, about, talks in ways that are just absolutely, I, I've never used this regard to the president before, not only incorrect but immoral. They're just simply wrong, simply wrong. And the one concern I have, and I understand it, is that people are going to be so frustrated, particularly in the communities that need the help the most, need to be treated most cl clearly and equally. They're going to say, it's not worth it at all. I'm not going to vote. The guy was a very good friend of mine. Talked to him two days before he died, John Lewis. As John said, the only answer is to vote. It's the only answer to be engaged in vote. Otherwise, nothing else works in a democracy. It doesn't work. The not so good guys win when we don't vote. I understand. I really do have a sense of the frustration. But so where I am, I absolutely believe. You know, when the United States, when America has set its mind to something, it's never, 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 never failed when we put our minds to, and we do it together. Never. We've gone through wars and pestilence, plague. We've gone through a lot. We're finally now getting to the point where we're going to be address the original sin of this country. 400 years old, it's the original sin, slavery, and all the vestiges of it. I'm not saying in four years, and I'm not even, this is not about a campaigning. I can't say if tomorrow God made me president. I can't guarantee you everything gets solved in four years. But I guarantee you one thing, it'll be a whole heck of a lot better. We'll move a lot further down the road. People fear that's what's, that which is different. We got to, for example, why in God's name don't we teach history in history classes? A black man invented the light bulb, not a white guy named Edison. OK? There's so much. Did anybody know before what, what, what's re recently happened? That black Wall Street in Oklahoma was burned to the ground? Anybody know these things? We act because we don't teach them. We got to give people facts. Teach them what's out there. The idea, I just spent time with a number of the NFL players and basketball, and excuse me, uh, um, basketball players, including Steph Curry. You know, these folks are making a difference now. It's not about fame or glory, because they have brothers themselves, fathers who've been beat up, who've been, who've been brutalized just because they're African Americans. They're about the time they're saying, I'm saying enough is enough. I think there is a chance for a real awakening here. And the point is, I don't think we have any alternative but to fight. I don't think we have any alternative but to fight back. I don't think we have another alternative than just go tell the truth. Just tell the truth. And a concluding comment I'll make is, you know, there's a lot of folks who thought that, well, the president's made great strides with his, this, this, his you know, law and order strides here that boy, after his convention, he really, re really made inroads. He hasn't. Not at all. No, I'm not serious. I, I mean, it should give you a little bit of confidence in the American people. They ain't buying it. Of all the millions and millions and millions of dollars being spent, they're not buying it. 
But we got to do more than them not buy it. We got to be honest with them and say, you got to step up. You got to step up. We got to do a lot more, a lot more than we've done. Because this is the first chance we've had in a generation, in my view, to deal and cut another slice off institutional racism toward getting into place where it changes. And by the way, the main reason why I'm optimistic, because of your generation, black, white, Hispanic, and Asian American. Did you ever think you'd turn on a TV? You're much younger than I am, but you're a little older than she is. Did you ever think you'd turn on the TV and roughly two out of three ads would be biracial couples selling a product? That never would have happened in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. The generation, this generation is a different generation. They're the least prejudiced, the most optimistic, the best educated, the most, most, most desirable of change of any generation. So we can't let them down. Those of us who are a lot older, we got to join and join them and do it now. Again, I, uh, I thank you. As I said, I am, I really am optimistic. And I promise you, win or lose, I'm going to go down fighting. And I'm going to go down fighting for racial equality, equity across the board. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, endowed by their creator. Well, that may be what your birthright was, but it's very different than actually being treated equally, being treated the same. Everything from black mortality rates in pregnancy straight through to educational opportunities and everything in between. But the country's ready. And if they're not, it doesn't matter because there are certain things I ain't going to change. There are certain things worth losing over. And this is something worth losing over. We have to, but we're not going to lose. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Round of applause, huh? Those, those were truly, truly unifying words in a community that needs healing and unification. Um, we'll go down fighting with you. We're definitely not going down. But let me say one thing, if I could, before I bring up Pastor Monroe Mitchell, is the gentleman in me, sir, would have to, I'd be remiss if I didn't welcome the Dr. Jill Biden. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please, let's welcome Dr. Jill Biden in appropriate way. Thank you. Welcome to Kenosha. Thank you very much. Pastor Monroe Mitchell, please come forward. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Mr. Biden, for uh, coming out. Uh, thank you, Pastor Barker, for uh, holding this uh, great community event, uh, this town hall meeting. And thank you to all the speakers, too, that came forth. There was so much said. And I want to thank you, too, Mr. Biden, for reminding us how important optimism is. You know, we deal with so much negativity. We deal with so many problems. We need to focus on being positive, being optimist, and dealing with the solutions. So, like I said, so much has been said, and uh, I'm thankful to even just grateful to even be invited to this. You know. So anyway, let us uh, stand as we get ready to dismiss in prayer. Father, we thank you once again. I thank you for your grace and for your mercy, your goodness and your kindness. Thank you, dear God, for allowing us to come together in a spirit of oneness. Thank you for uh, allowing Mr. Biden to take time out of his busy schedule. And thank you, dear God, for allowing us to bring some issues to the table. And Father, I pray right now, dear God, that you take out hatred, that you move out hatred from our community and replace it with love. Father, I pray sincerely and seriously, dear God, that you remind us each and every day that we can too be resilient and have tenacity and move forward away from this destruction. And Lord God, I pray that you allow this community to heal Kenosha. I pray, dear God, that you bless Kenosha, that you bring us back together, that you tear down the walls 
uh, that separate us for, because of race and other issues. And I pray, dear God, that you open up the channels of communication that much more between your people. And Father, this is not something that just started recently. This is something that's been going on for a while. So we pray, dear God, that you once again continue to protect Kenosha, continue to protect Wisconsin, continue to protect this country, and also continue to protect this world. We lift up the Blake family today. Jacob Blake, we pray and ask that you touch him miraculously and triumphantly with his illness, with his pain, and with his suffering. We pray, dear God, for his family as they go through this healing process, as they deal with all of these things in the media and the you know, situations with the police department and so forth. But Father, I won't stop there. I'll pray and ask that you touch the Kenosha Police Department for those that are doing the great job that's needed to be done in the community. And I pray that you'll touch the hearts of those that are not, the hearts of those that may allow racism to come in and bigotry to come in and hatred to come in. For we know that some of it is learned behavior. It's unfortunate. But we pray, Father, that you allow this community to work together. As so many have said today, we need to rebuild. We need to reconstruct. But I pray, Father, that we will rely on you as our ultimate source of strength. So, Lord God, as we get ready to leave this place, only dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. Now may the grace of God rest, rule, and reside in each and every one of our hearts today and forevermore. As we'll give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory that you so rightfully deserve, and much, much more. And Father, I pray as none other than a servant who stands behind the cross. And I pray, dear God, in the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior. And let everyone say, amen, amen, amen. amen. Thank you, Pastor Monroe. This concludes the program. We're going to ask that everyone please stay where you are. State staff will take over. We're going to take a photo, and they will direct traffic. Before we begin into that process, um, I'd like to thank Pastor Barker for hosting us here today, and Dr. Joe Biden and Vice President uh, Joe Biden for being here. Um, we wish you well. We thank you for bring, bringing the unifying force to Kenosha. This is a community of, of immigrants, and blacks, and Latinos, Germans, Polish, Italians. We work together. We're hurting right now. We know our challenge is to dig deep in our inner soul to heal our own community. We look forward to your leadership and the leadership of Senator Kamala Harris to restore faith in this community and faith in this country. God bless you. <laughs>